anniversary of TechFest, the annual science and technology festival of IIT Bombay. With the motto of promoting technology, scientific thinking and innovation, TechFest has passed 14 golden editions and today it is a body working for the betterment of society in general and students in particular under the patronage of UNESCO. We are delighted to have a very special person with us today, Professor Mustansir Burma. Professor Burma is an internationally renowned researcher in the field of statistical mechanics and condensed matter physics. He is currently the director of India's premier research institution, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. His distinctions include the Shanti Swarup Patnagar Prize for the Physical Sciences awarded by the CSIR. He has given the TAE Raja Ramanna Prize Lecture in Physics in the year 2004. He has also received the SN Bose Birth Centenary Award of the Indian Science Congress in the year 2007. Currently, he is the chair of the INSA National Committee of the Indian International Union of Pure and Applied Physics. Over his long career, he has published over 100 research papers and has spoken at many international conferences. Based on his knowledge, enthusiasm and experience, he is eminently qualified to speak with us today about his topic, Order, Out of Disorder. As he himself said of his own guide, Professor B. M. Udgaonkar, we will get a glimpse of how physics works and how a physicist thinks. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Mustansir Burma. This is one reason one wants to do science. The real reason is something 
something that had not said. It's sort of very exciting. Why is it exciting? Because, you know, you work, work, work. Once in a while you get an insight, you get a flash. Oh, this is the way it is. And, you know, you're the only person in the, on the whole planet who has that particular insight at that time. It's like an explorer. You step on, you know, you're the first person to reach Antarctica. I mean, must have been thrilled, right? So it's the same sort of feeling. You know, it's the first time that anybody has thought of this. Uh, and, and you know, in mathematics, people often talk about the mathematical landscape. I don't know if you've encountered that in your reading. You know, this is something I did not plan to say, but let me say it. In mathematics, there's a big discussion. Is mathematics real or is it all in the mind? Is there a mathematical landscape, you know, something? Why landscape? Because like the Himalayas are real, they are there, you go climb them, you know, they are very real. In the same sense, in the world of ideas, is there something really there and you are studying it or it's all there? You know, so this, this is a subject that goes on, uh, debate that goes on. So let me come back to my talk. Alright, so now, order and disorder. So, you know, the first thing one ought to do is to get you know, things a little clear. What, what is all? What, is this? what do you do? You go to a dictionary. And now, you know, in this day and age, you don't open a book, you go online, and you look at the Oxford Dictionary online. So what you find is the definition of order. So order, I mean, it's a long definition, goes on for three lines, I've sort of cut it down a little bit. It's the arrangement or disposition uh, of something according to a particular sequence or pattern or method. You know, makes sense, order, you know, so, something that you recognize, okay. You know, all sitting in ordered rows, very nice, you know. You could have done something more haphazard, but you know, so, so that, that's order. Disorder, they have a very short definition. It's just it's a state of confusion. Okay. Right, it uh, also makes sense. Now, surely, I mean, you know, like when we're in school, we learn about synonyms and antonyms. Opposite, antonyms being opposite, opposites. And one might think, sort of generally correctly, that disorder is the opposite of order. And sure, it is. So normally you would expect, this is the common wisdom, that disorder opposes order. Right? Because they are opposite, simply. But, in fact, what I will try to argue in this talk, generally that might be true. But there are certain situations in which disorder actually promotes order, sets in order. Now, how can it? You know, so this is what I want to convey. So this is one of the sort of nice ideas that came up in physics sometimes. <coughs> and I uh, would like to convey this. Okay. Let me go now. Okay. So what I'll try to do in the rest of the talk is sort of the three broad parts to the talk. One, I'll talk about disorder and options. Options in the sense that, you know, Options for doing something. Option. Everybody knows what option is, right? And you may do this, but you may do that, or that, or that. So that, there are a number of options. I mean, like if you arrive at South Restaurant, which is the you know point in Bombay, as the name tells you, there are seven options to go this way or that way. There are seven routes. You know, so usually there are not so many, but you know, once in a while you might have more options than you do uh, elsewhere. So. Uh, so I'll talk about the relation between disorder and options, you know, how many options we have. And generally, the more the options, the more the disorder, generally. And, you know, what, what we'll be talking about is the notion of probability. Probability simply means likelihood. You know, how likely is it that something will happen? And, you know, that is a, you know, concept we associate, let's say, with uh, gambling or race cause or stock market or weather or something. But it's actually there all the time and it's a really probability just as energy is a force in some sense for change, it causes change. So does probability. I, mean, this is, I will try to convey that in, in some way. Uh, then I'm using this word entropy. How many of you have heard of the word entropy? So quite a few. No. Why I'm saying this when I first uh, noted the idea of the talk, I used the word entropy in the title. And there was immediate, immediately chastised by the organizer, don't use such a technical word. But okay, so I, I withdrew it. Yeah. Nevertheless, I'm going to uh, use it in my talk. Entropy is one of those words, you have to watch out. You know, 
you take, uh, let's say, five physicists, put them in a room, and ask them what is entropy, you get five answers. So it's, it, it's one of those multi, uh, multi-meaning words. You know, it has all sorts of <coughs> definitions. Uh, and uh, well, I'll, I'll discuss one or two of those today. Entropy is related to disorder in a very fundamental way. And I'll try to at least tell you all about it. The last thing I'll talk about is disorder of another sort. <coughs> disorder in this city, in the city of Mumbai. I mean, you know, what do people in Mumbai do? They get up, they go somewhere, and what do they encounter? They encounter crowds. Okay, sometimes uh, they get into cars and, you know, move. then they're caught in traffic, you know, they're in traffic. And then if they have some spare money, they invest in the stock market. You know, so I'll talk about these three sort of very central things about Bombay and how physics or science has actually something to offer for some of them. Maybe not the last, but for the first two. <coughs> Alright, so this is the roadmap of the talk. So let's begin. First of all, you know, you recall that definition from Oxford uh, Dictionary Online, you know, when it talked about or it said something about pattern. And that is really the heart of it. If you have a pattern in something, then you, or you know, something that's not totally higgledy piggledy random, then you can say there's some degree of order. <coughs> this is some very simplistic uh, you know, depiction of that. Here is something with equal number of green and red squares here on, on the left hand side. And uh, the arrangement of reds and greens is pretty random. Right? You'll agree. I mean, okay, so there's no discernible pattern in the arrangement. And so this is something that you would, you know, reasonably and correctly call a disordered uh, pattern, I mean, disordered arrangement. All right, so it's a random arrangement just so. Now, uh, by contrast, if you have mainly green squares and a few red squares, because these red, red squares could be anywhere, there would be some degree of disorder, but uh, it, the whole thing is largely ordered. I mean, so if you're thinking of green as a sort of, uh, well, in a physics context, you might think of uh, like small magnetic moments in, on atoms if they are pointing up, <coughs> a few of them pointing down, then you have a net ordered state, net magnetic. <coughs> now, uh, the, what's the connection with options? The connection is simply the following, that if you have a disordered arrangement like this, okay, simplest thing you can think of in terms of uh, arrangements is take a coin and toss it. So, if you keep tossing a coin, uh, as you get a heads or a tail, if you have, uh, let's say, an equal number of heads and tails, you can ask how many options are there with that constraint. Something that I'm sure many of you can work out, right? I mean, something C, something else, okay? Then C back, actually. And if you work it out, it's 252. All right, now, now what, what is the point? Let's go back here. Generally, if you have a disordered thing, it's a random amount. So it stands to reason, doesn't it, that the more random an arrangement, the more ways are, are there of having random arrangements. Of course, each arrangement is completely different from the other, but they're all random. In that sense, they're all in one class. So the class of random disordered arrangements is, you know, therefore likely to be much larger, many more options, than something that is <coughs> they order. For instance, if you have, if you ask, in how many ways can I achieve 10 heads? You know, if I toss a coin 10 times, I get heads all each time. If I insist on that, there's only one way. I have to get heads and heads and heads and heads. Whereas if it was 5 and 5, you know, there are many ways to it. So this is just illustrating that. So the message you might take away from this slide is that, look, a disordered state, hmm? using the word state advisedly, it's not a configuration. Configuration is like a particular realization. This particular uh, set of uh, random arrangements. The state is the set, the whole collection. So the uh, disordered state has many more options than an ordered state. That, that, that's all I would convey. It's a simple point, but that, you know, it's, it's an important point. Now, a little bit of a sort of connection to something that one can measure, you know, in science, in physics, when, you, when we heat water, etc. So don't, don't get daunted by these formulae, let me explain. Uh, 
So we've just talked about options. If you have a disordered state, you have many options. If you have an ordered state, you probably have fewer options. But let's say capital W, okay, historical by capital W, I don't know. Uh, capital W is a number that's the total number of options. It's very large. <coughs> so, uh, we haven't yet defined entropy. Entropy, okay, so let, let, let me come back to those five physicists who are so giving you five different definitions of entropy. Entropy is a very um, elusive but important concept. Okay. Uh, keeps coming up in science in contexts when, where it has no right to show up, you know, it just shows up. Most recently in the theory of black holes. You know, black holes, as you all know, are very dense objects in the sky, which are so dense that they have collapsed through a state which is so dense it doesn't let light escape. So you can't see what is happening inside a black hole. Nevertheless, there is very good evidence and people know that you have, you know, black holes all over the place. Now, it turns out the area of a black hole is connected to its entropy. I mean, some strange and weird thing that uh, has been discovered and it's true. Okay, I mean, this need not have happened, it did. But what is the older meaning of entropy? Entropy, uh, entropy change is something that many engineering students will be familiar with. You know, first and second laws of thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, the change of entropy is related to heat exchange between two bodies. Uh, let me just say. On the other hand, if you go to an information theorist, you say, no, nothing of the sort. That Shannon told us what entropy is, and it's something completely different. So if you talk to an astrophysicist, information theorist, or a chemical engineer, they give you different versions of the same. But in some sense, the, the very fundamental, the most fundamental definition, uh, one of the most fundamental definitions of entropy relates it to the number of options. This is important. So, what do I mean? So, you take a system. Here's a bottle of water, right? So, there's water here. State is quite well defined. I mean, the water has this density, it's at this pressure, etc. Nevertheless, if you look at the molecules that constitute the water, they are moving around and every, they are going over many, many, many different options of infinity. The log, Ln means log to the base E. Okay? Log to <coughs> the total number of options is related to the entropy. This was a sort of key insight. I mean, uh, sort of, it, it, it's one of those great flashes of intuition which uh, occurred to Boltzmann in the 19th century. And it's one of the three or four very big uh, forward steps in science, I would say in that century, Darwin, Maxwell being the others involved. Okay. Now, why is entropy important? It's important because there's a general principle which says that if you leave something alone, it will do what it wants, but ultimately it will go to a state which makes the entropy as big as possible. So that's what it is. Anyway, this is a historical aside. Uh, Planck, have you heard of Planck, Max Planck? You know, uh, yeah, so he was the person who brought out Boltzmann's contribution in a central way to <coughs> And uh, actually, uh, you know, people used to con confuse Planck and Boltzmann earlier, but, but that's the sense of Let's come down. Now, the next slide is a little uh, technical, and I'll just uh, point out that it's technical. I won't go through it. I, but this is what I said, that it's related to the heat exchange. Uh, you know, at some temperature t, and this is like a, an engineering of a physics or engineering definition of entropy. There is a more microscopic definition, which is the one we have just seen in the previous slide. K log w, k is a constant, it's called the Boltzmann constant. Here, uh, I've dropped the k and I've written in gamma, but it's the same thing, it's the log of the number of options. You know, this is in a well-known textbook, and as he says, he also says, this assumption is a masterpiece of Boltzmann. Now, okay, it's not uh, perhaps the most uh, efficacious English, but uh, this brings across the point. Okay, and this is probably the most technical slide I have, so you know, I'm not going to uh, 
Gelege ist. Kann jemand sehen, dass ich das Okay, das ist Boltzmann. This is a grave in Vienna. Do you see this is a stripe on this grave? It's there for it. Um, uh, now, Boltzmann. You know, Boltzmann was a, you know, uh, one of the great minds of the uh, 19th century. Uh, <coughs> suicide. I mean, due to a number of uh, reasons, but uh, whatever. Uh, he had a student. Ellen West, Paul Ellen West, also quite a well-known person, who also later committed suicide. But Ellen West had a student named that Wollenberg. So whenever, I mean, every day people would wait to see whether Wollenberg will show up. <laughs> and he did, you know, I mean, he, he died a natural death, so I didn't just tell you that. Now, uh, okay. you know, so Boltzmann taught Ellen West, who taught Wollenberg. Wollenberg taught somebody named Max Dresden. Uh, now, I've attended lectures from Max Dresden. So, therefore, I feel, you know, I have a. <laughs> <laughs> now, more to the point, I mean, at least you'll have attended one lecture by me. <laughs> so, therefore, please. <laughs> okay. All right. A great physicist and a great scientist. Read, read about him. Internet is one way. Books and. Okay, anyway, so this is Boltzmann. And uh, his life is also interesting, but uh, of course his achievements in science are extremely, you know, uh, very hugely important. Okay, let us go. Now, let's come back to our city, Mumbai, in earlier days, Bombay. And certainly in this time that I'm talking about, 1845, it was Mumbai. This is a piece of history I just thought I will interject because it's sort of related to what we're talking about. And it's the following. Let's say Boltzmann <coughs> was a great admirer <coughs> of James Clark Maxwell. Maxwell was a scientist in Britain who did many things. He worked out the laws of electromagnetism, that is one. But also, equally important, he worked on what's called the kinetic theory, the theory of gases. Now, what is the kinetic theory of gases? It says that, look, gases are made of molecules, as is the rest of matter, but it is a, it's not so dense, the system, so that the molecules actually move around, and when they hit the wall, that's uh, the impact which produces the phenomenon of pressure. It, it, that, that is the kinetic theory. But then, of course, you can work out many aspects of it, and Maxwell did. So Maxwell in 1859 worked out what is known as the distribution of velocities of gas molecules. Have you all heard anything about this earlier? <coughs> and we call, also call it the Maxwell distribution. It turns out that in Bombay, 40 years before that, this many aspects of Maxwell's calculations were already done. Nobody knows it as well as I <coughs> Let me just at least tell you all. There's another uh, Scotsman, he was working in the East India Company in Bombay. His name was John Waterston. And he used to sit, you know, after his duties, which consisted of teaching the maritime core of East India Company, something about mathematics, and he would have a lot of spare time. So according to Wikipedia, he would go to Grant College and sit in the library and work there. Now, what is Grant College? Uh, I try to find out, and as far as I can tell, it's probably Grant Medical College, which started in the same year, 1845. I don't know, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to find out. Anyway, uh, he understood this point that Ma Maxwell came to nature and derived something known as the equipartition of energy, a very fundamental theorem about uh, how the energy of gas molecules is distributed. <coughs> he wrote a paper, you know, and he sent it to the Royal Society in London. Unfortunately, the referees there rejected it. One of them actually wrote, this, this paper is nothing but nonsense. Uh, it says something about the referee, not about what is called. Anyway, uh, it was published 50 years later when Lord Raleigh found this manuscript and understood its significance, but that was after his death. So he never got the credit that he really deserved. But at least we from the city, I know not all of you are from Mumbai, but you are visiting Mumbai. This was a great contribution, unfortunately not well recognized. 
okay, this happens. This is his paper. You can find it. <coughs> All right. Now, now let me come to illustrating this point about disorder and order, and how order can be promoted. Or what does it mean? So let, let me just and to do that. Let me you know think of a see in physics. What we do is the order. Okay, suppose you want to understand something. We don't, we intentionally try not to understand, you know, what you want to understand in full detail. Move away from it. Take a limit. It keeps something about the problem, but it doesn't really keep every detail of the problem. Make a caricature of the problem. Why would you do that? Why, why do you want to lose your whole problem? The answer is that if you make a caricature which has the essence of what is going on, then you are much more likely to be able to understand the workings of that caricature than the whole thing. Because the whole thing is complex and there is this and that and that. And you just get trapped in a maze. So the art of science lies in throwing away the inessential things and keeping only the bare essence and dealing with it. So it's in that same spirit that we deal with this condition of hard objects. What are these hard objects? They're just things that are hard. They cannot penetrate each other. You know, so like you can imagine these are coins are the carom board, for instance, you know, that picture there. And these are needles which are sort of thrown on paper or something of that sort. Uh, now, uh, what I'm going to do, okay, first of all, I remind you that entropy, which is the standard uh, measure of disorder, is given by some constant times the log of the number of options. Now, number of options, Let, let's just backtrack for a minute. They are large, I said. It's a large number. How large is the number of options? For instance, consider molecules in a you know, reasonably sized container. How many options are there? It's a huge number. It's a sort of mind-boggling number. <coughs> Suppose I asked you for a large number. Give me any large number. Can somebody give me a large number? Million. Ten million. Okay, that's pretty large. You can ask for something larger, like the number of protons in the universe. You'll agree that's large. That's about 10 to the 50. So these numbers are all nothing compared to the number of options of arranging molecules in a container. That number is 10 raised to, now brace yourself, it's 10 raised to 10. No, it's all. I get over myself. So it's 10 raised to 10 raised to 23. Okay, so I mean, you, it's sort of mind boggling. This is in a realistic uh, container. I mean, if you have a tiny thing, okay, maybe it will be 10 raised to 10 to the 18. But, okay, big deal. I mean, I still can't imagine it, right? I mean, it's a sort of a huge number. So, I mean, so, so now, no wonder we take a log. <laughs> At least we can deal with the number then. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, the, uh, this number is sort of, Mind blowing. You know, just sit for five minutes and just try to imagine the number it. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, whatever it is, we, we want to deal with this number. You know, uh, because when we take a log and we instruct it to do so, then we will be able to deal with something that's measurable and physical, like the entropy. Okay. Now, uh, all I'm saying is that this number, this number of options, will. In, so, su suppose you have this situation here. And you ask for the number of options of arranging uh, this. Okay, there will be sort of a large number of options. Then you can try to estimate that. If you have needles of an equal number, and you try to arrange them so that they don't go with that, they are hard, so they don't go with that, now you'll, you'll also get a number, but that will be different. And so it's reasonable that this number, whatever it is, should depend on the shape of the object. It will also depend on the density. How many needles do you have? I mean, the answer in this case might be different from that. All right. So, uh, I'm repeating something I said earlier. Uh, see, it's not that we don't encounter, uh, if we don't encounter ordered states in, you know, uh, physics or science or something, we do all the time. But usually, it's always portrayed, and correctly so, as a fight between energy and entropy. Entropy is the bad guy, usually. Disorder. Entropy causes disorder. Energy likes to promote order states. 
So the energy and entropy is sort of uh, compete and the temperature decides which one will be. Low temperature is energy wins, high temperature entropy wins for, for good reasons. So this is the way it's usually portrayed. But I'm going to now point out that this is not always true and ordering can result purely from entropy, even if there's no energy in the problem. And entropy can give you ordered states. Okay, so here. This was first, uh, actually I'm not sure he was the very first, but one of the first people to present this theory. And this is the famous scientist, I'd say, not physicist or chemist, because he's contributed so much to physics and chemistry on some Nobel Prize in chemistry, but actually I would say physics can equally claim them. That's one of them. They wrote uh, on Saga uh, long ago in the 1940s, uh, looked at the, the same uh, question that I was posing, namely, in how many ways can you arrange needles on a piece of paper so that they don't do that? Now, what, why was he doing that? See, he was interested in a particular health problem. There's something called the tobacco mosaic virus. Those of you with the biology background may know about it. I, I didn't know too much about it, but I read a little bit. These are viruses. Viruses, you're all familiar with. We all have viral fever once in a while. So, virus. Now, this tobacco mosaic virus is about 300 nanometers long and about 18 nanometers broad. So, it's very long. It's much longer than... And to a very good approximation, it's a needle. Now, it turns out, if you look at tobacco mosaic virus in solution, even at a very small concentration, you find that these viruses are all lining up. They are all pointing roughly the same way. And Onsanga was interested to find out why. This is why he studied the problem. I won't go into the calculations which is little involved, but he found that needles, in fact, reach an ordered state, they order Orientationally, orientationally meaning, you know, I mean, they don't point in random directions. They point in a roughly the same direction, like uh, as I have shown here. Okay, I should have, uh, yeah, anyway, this is a picture of that. With, what is that direction? That you can't tell. It could be this way, or it could be that way, it could be that way, we don't know. But, so there is some breaking of the symmetry, but they all roughly point in the same direction. But why do they, see, in this problem, in hard, objects, there is no notion of energy because every arrangement has equal, equal energy. It is not that energy is causing one arrangement over the other. So, it must be that this ordered state is happening because you increase the number of options. But how can that be? <coughs> Right? If I have a random arrangement of things, random point, randomly pointing, suppose I have this, this way, and okay, yeah, this, this way. <coughs> if they can point randomly, there are more options than if I say that they are both parallel. Would you agree? So, this seems a little odd, but the reason is actually not that hard to see. So, what is the reason? Normally we argue that, look, you prefer disorder because you have more options. Now you are saying that, yeah, okay, but you still get order. How? The answer is that you do in fact get more options from the order. And why is that? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's the following uh, sort of uh, notion that if you th put things roughly parallel, then they can slide very easily because there is a long gap. Then you have things arranged in random ways and you know, this couldn't slide without hitting something else. Is that intuitive? Mm -hmm. I, I hope it is. This, I'm just trying to explain the intuitive uh, understanding, not the mathematics behind it, right? <coughs> so, by aligning things, you are allowing them much more room to slide. For instance, look at this particular needle here. You know, you can't see it very well. But it has some room to slide. Now, if you have this density and this sort of arrangement, nothing can move. I mean, it just hits something else. So, so what, what is happening is that you give up the entropy or the disorder that comes with the orientation. You go along with aligning. 
so that you get, get a lot of sliding, uh, sliding options. So I hope the message is clear. We still always maximize the number of options. We still maximize the entropy, which is a measure of the number of options. But maximizing options is not the same as promoting disorder. Or, so this is a, it's a simple idea in the end. But when it first came to you know light, people were surprised because they were so used to thinking about disorder as uh, the natural outcome of maximizing entropy that this was a surprise. Is this reasonably clear at the back? Yeah. Okay. So here is what happens in uh, you know simulations of sort of naive that you can do uh, as you increase the density. This is a low density. By density, I don't mean the actual density. I mean whether it's a plastic needle or iron. I don't mean that. I mean the number density. How many needles per unit area, right? So you keep increasing that. And as you do, so there's actually a transition. It turns out that uh, there's this critical density below which things are actually arranged in random uh, directions, but above which there is a setting in a good direction. Now, so there is an ordered state that forms and it's depicted here. In fact, for, um, you know, that this particular ordered state is a particularly delicate and beautiful sort of ordered state in, in some sense that I will not be able to go into. Anyway, let, let, let me move on. Now, it turns out this idea, okay, I mean, is this just a theoretical idea, fine, I mean, needles on a plane, you know, okay, mm -hmm. fine, you're sort of playing with them, or is it really of some uh, importance and does it have implications for real experiments? The answer is, yeah, is that it does. <coughs> Back on the this system that is started with, actually, or this spread because of that. Colloidal systems actually go into an ordered crystalline array. You, you have colloids. Colloids are largish particles on some scale, micron sized. Everybody know what a micron is? Micrometer. Micro is 10 to the minus 6. You have these, obviously, they're much bigger than atoms. But uh, in a solution, they sometimes form beautiful, very ordered arrangements. So let, let's try to understand that. Why does that happen? Why, but see, it's clear you're cutting down the number of options, right? Things are randomly placed. Certainly, they would seem to have more options. Yet, it's that same principle which is causing the crystal order to come in, you know, very regular spaces. Okay. Why? You, the answer is that you cut down the entropy of uh, placement by doing this. But what you gain is because you have a regular spacing, you have much more room for each particle to vibrate around its average. So it's like the needles. You give up your orientation so that you can gain sliding. Here you give up placement so you can gain vibration. So it, 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 it's a recurring. <coughs> And it happens again and again, and in many, many systems in, you know, that we deal with in the laboratory, this is an operative theme. And uh, the whole phenomenon of freezing, you know, forming crystals. Earlier the view used to be that, oh, that happens because, you know, you have atoms, and things like to sort of sit at a distance so that they can minimize energy. And that's there a little bit, it's not total rubbish, it's there. But the entropic contribution coming from just the fact that you have more options if you do that is equally and sometimes predominantly important. Okay, let me move on. Let me now change to another sort of scenario. We'll talk about order and disorder in everyday life. Is that all right? Or do you all want more of the lab stuff? Okay, we will well, be that as a pillar. Let me talk about the city. Okay, so here are three uh, scenes which should be familiar from uh, familiar to most of you who come or even visit cities, right? So here is traffic, and it stopped. This is a traffic jam. Okay, here is uh, probably Shell Station, and uh, there's a crowd. 
Okay, so traffic and crowds. And this is in the middle of uh, something called the Bombay Stock Exchange. It's in Dalal Street in South Mumbai. And you can see all these excited people. <laughs> Traders shouting, you know, buying and selling and whatever. But these are just, I just picked up three pictures to pick the three things and talk about. Now, what are you doing listening to a lecture on, you know, from a physics person? What's he going to say about this property? I mean, you might wonder, but I have something to say. It's so, so well. <coughs> okay, but I'm going first going to go back to physics before I talk about uh, traffic and you know all these things. So in physics, we keep dealing with uh, what should I say? Uh, systems of things <coughs> in which you have many many objects. They could be, as we saw, tobacco mosaic by this whole bunch of them in solution, or they could even be atoms in, you know, in a solid or in, or they could be, as I said, spins which are pointing up or down, whatever. And you remember the idea of a state is not a single configuration. A state is a bunch of, you know, similar configuration. The system, you know, as it changes in time visits one configuration, then the other, then the other, then the other, but it's all, always in the same state. Now, here is a particular configuration. So, this is sort of blues and reds in it. And, uh, this is my way of depicting something that uh, has some random arrangement of stuff. Now, often, see, average, average color, you can say, is neither blue nor red, something in between. But fine, there's a notion of average. Like, like there's an average age. I was asking somebody, what's the average age? They said, probably 20. But how many of you are actually 20? Very few. Okay. Maybe the estimate was very badly wrong. Or it could, <laughs> no, it could be that it's average age is 20, and it, you know, that you are 17, and uh, somebody else is 25. And so it's average is not true. So you know, it's actually much more interesting to look at the fluctuations than the average quite often. So, uh, in the same sense, you know, if you look at any system, the fluctuation, something that will fluctuate away from the average is always interesting. So, here's a, what happens, you have some system, let's say it has density, maybe by some flow, lots of uh, molecules change together, you have a little bit higher density than usual. <coughs> but usually, that will happen, it will go away. So, usually if you have a fluctuation from the average, Fluctuate by but it will die out. Fluctuate again, die out. But once in a while, these fluctuations can do something drastic. And this is what I wanted to say. And see, in, uh, you know, scientists or physicists have sort of trained or you know, learn how to deal with fluctuations, how to characterize them, how to hopefully control them also. So sometimes a fluctuation can trigger something, an avalanche of other fluctuations and eventually the whole system can overturn and go to a new average. Okay. So this is what can happen and the only thing about the scientists or physicists is that they, you know, they have to attend class and learn how to deal with this, they have to do problems with dealing with fluctuations. So they are well trained in fluctuations. That, that's what I mean. Now what is the consequence of growing fluctuations for these situations that we described? For instance, for traffic, which is smoothly flowing, suddenly the density becomes very large. It's a fluctuation. But will it die out? We hope it dies out, you know, and you know, we resume, but it doesn't always. And then it leads to a jam. In a crowd, you know, people are moving along. This. Somebody might stumble and fall. You know, the person gets up and gets going, but it may not happen. It might get a stampede. <coughs> Stock market, because fluctuations are the essence of the stock market, but you know sometimes the fluctuation can sort of really become unbound and just go up and then it will crash. So the idea of using physics is that maybe the things that we learn about in physics can help in some of these. So let's see. Now here is what physicists did with traffic. You know? uh, so you remember what I said about the philosophy of doing physics. Don't address the problem that you really have to, I mean, in full detail, abstract it, make it simple, but don't lose the essence of the problem. So what, 
was actually done by these two people, Nagel and Schreckenberg, German physicists, is that they said, we are not going to model you know, actual car movement and actual uh, traffic very carefully. What we'll do is we'll consider the road as made up of a succession of boxes. Okay? I mean, so in the sense that a car can be either here or there. Of course, that, that's not true. Cars can actually move smoothly, but they said, let's forget it. This, let, let's just model it this way. So there are cars in boxes. When a car moves, it goes from one box to the other. This is the way they do it. Okay? And uh, so each box can either go, have zero cars or one car. <coughs> Seems a pretty bad model. <coughs> now, uh, they. But they had a you know, physics background, they couldn't help it. They had to do something of this sort. So they, they did it, and they tried this, and they tried that, they put in acceleration with this, and they looked at the simulation, and they found that it looked nothing like real traffic. So, until they had an insight. You know, so, so they put in very reasonable rules that if you have a car in front, then you go at a certain velocity, and if you're so many feet behind, you'll start to so down. all that was put in, but did the ultimate flow did not resemble traffic until they put in an element of humanness, namely randomness. Yeah. So there's a person driving in front of you, driving, and suddenly for no reason at all it will break. <laughs> <laughs> this happens. It looks random. It's human. And well, they put this into the model. It's very easy to put in a model. You put in a certain probability that something odd will happen. The moment they did this. All the flows began to resemble real traffic data perfectly. <coughs> so it seems that this was the crucial small insight that they added, which was very important. Now, okay, so then are they doing this to satisfy themselves or is it actually useful? Today, this Nagel Schreckenberg model with minor modifications is actually used in Germany to predict highway uh, traffic flow. So it's there. It's used in all of northern Germany. The highway traffic is uh, 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 sort of mapped out by satellite and then quickly simulated on a computer and then drivers can get a one hour forecast on it about what will happen. But that of course, I mean separately I'm just saying, raises another issue. If you are a driver, you have to decide how to go from in some cities like Essen to Cologne probably. And now you, there are two ways to go and you get this forecast. So what would you do? I mean there's road A and road B. <coughs> so now that you know that this is the prediction, I mean, if you're normal, instead of taking road A, you take road B. But then you might be a little more clever. And you might say, oh, most people will see this and therefore take road A. <laughs> so let me stick to road A. But then, you know, you can go one more step and keep... Uh, so, well, ultimately they did a survey to find out what people do. It's just a sort of uh, interesting. And uh, turns out there are three equal classes. You know, the, the first class takes a road A. Maybe after an infinite loop, but they take a road A. Second class, anyway, takes road B. And the third class actually they look at the thing, but they don't decide. They just go there and at the last minute they decide. <laughs> so, so I'm not sure this does any good, but uh, at least the German authorities think it's very good. Okay, so, so much for tracking. I mean, Nagel and Trek were the, you know, statistical physicists like me, and, you know, so there's some contribution to, uh, you know, problems in everyday life. Now here's another contribution which has actually saved a lot of lives. And you know, it's not that I have contributed, but as a member of the field of statistical physics, I feel quite proud of this. You know, so, so let me just tell you, crowds. How do crowds behave? How do people react? How do they move? Now again, you know, so there are lots of <coughs> studies. By the way, traffic also. Nagel and Schreckenberg were not the first persons who studied traffic. It's been studied for about 50, 100 years by traffic engineers and this and that. But it's just that they had a small insight which helped. Now, here in the crowd thing, also it's like that. There have been many studies of crowds earlier, but these people, particularly the first person, Helbing, Dirk Helbing, 
has uh, actually managed to do something quite nice. Okay, so let, let, let me quickly tell you about it. So, uh, the, the only element they put in really in this model is that if there's a person who would like to keep a distance from other persons, try not to bump into a person generally. You know. uh, so, uh, they, they put things like that and you know, some uh, other <coughs> fairly, uh, also, whatever, not obvious, but fairly reasonable, uh, you know, criteria to the model. Now, it turns out that the behavior of uh, people is actually quite funny. I mean, it's quite counterintuitive. I mean, in the end, you can understand it, but it's a, it's a little odd. Now, just to skip something and just to tell you, uh, for instance, if you have an auditory right here, and you want to design exits, you can design an exit with a certain uh, you know, width. Now you think if you increase the width, you will increase the flow and it, it, people can enter it <coughs> earlier. But the answer is no, it doesn't happen. If you increase it, it slows down. It slows down because of the behavior of people. Because when it becomes a little wider, people think they can get through two at a time. And then they get stuck. You know, so, <laughs> so, so it's things like that, you know. Uh, the other thing that is apparently well known, which sounds the present first time, is that if you have to send people in a certain direction, you should put obstacles. Normally you think that without obstacles you can move more quickly, but obstacles sort of guide you. It's not so uh, difficult in that, and so on. And of course people have a herding tendency, that, meaning that here are two exits, both are equally good, but very few people are taking this. Everybody says, this means there's something right about this. All these things happen. Now, coming back to saving lives. Um, you know, this is the picture of the Kaaba in Mecca. And this is the Hajj pilgrimage that happened every year. And uh, if you all remember, you know, I mean, associated with the, this pilgrimage is something else where the, invariably there would be a stampede. Some 200, 300 people would be sort of crushed to death very often. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, see, at some point, the Saudi authorities did something quite nice. They contacted this person, help me. And they told him that, look, can you do something to prevent this uh, sandpit? So, he actually, see, okay, what, what, did, what was helping doing any? He used to make these sort of simulations and computer simulations of crowd movement and all sorts of things, you know, for a number of years. And you publish his results in physics journals because it's sort of allowed to do that. Okay, now, uh, so Saudi people came to know, the Saudi Arabs came to know about this, they asked him. So, he studied the videos, which, you know, of the stampede. And what you notice is before the stampede actually happened, actually event, Quite a bit before that, there was some strange precursor movement in the crowd. Now, uh, he had seen that precursor movement in his simulation. Simulations was just doing for, you know, like an academic bit. And he correlated the two. Having seen those in a toy, caricature, very silly model, he had understood the reason for the for that behavior in his mind. Having understood it, he knew what he had to do to prevent it. So he could apply that thinking to the real situation. <coughs> Somebody interviewed him afterwards and he said he hesitated a lot to agree to do anything for the authorities because he said, you know, after all, it in a model. Suppose it doesn't work, more lives might be lost. But then he finally did it. And uh, so what he implemented finally, I believe, was simply a you know, proper... <laughs> ...positionings of uh, the proper positionings of the entrances and exits. Variations in that. And since then, there have been more. So the last four years, five years, <laughs> Can you hear me? Now? <coughs> yes? Can I turn it off? Yes. Alright. So, so uh, this is an application 
from a bona fide statistical physicist, which has actually helped save lives. So this is what I've said. Applications are recent, recent and successful. I'm sorry, I've run out of time, right? Somebody should have told me. Uh, I'll stop. It, so. yeah. uh, last thing I won't spend much time on is physics and the stock market. You know, so here are uh, stock price variations on any old stock <coughs> some, over many years. Here is something completely different. This is the behavior of velocity in a particular region in a turbulent flow. The two problems have nothing to do with each other. Nevertheless, you know, often leaps of somehow uh, progress are made by recognizing an animal. But just look at this in some gross way. The patterns are roughly similar. In other words, here are fluctuations. <coughs> On the whole, they were well made, but once in a while, there are huge fluctuations in this turbulence problem. So also in the stock market. So is there something that we know about in turbulence or in the study of fluid flow that we can use for the stock market? You know, this is simply the similarity between the two which triggered this chain of thought. And in fact, uh, this approach, this what I call the physics approach, in other words, just take nothing for granted. Just analyze the data, try to uncover laws by, by yourself, build simple models, test the models against data. This is the sort of bread and butter approach. And uh, this is the approach that people have taken. And uh, rather successfully or not, you can judge for yourself. There's a fledgling field <coughs> that has formed, which is called econophysics. There's even a textbook of econophysics that you see right there. And uh, well, at least the physics approach has helped to organize data, and for better or for worse, physics PhDs are being offered, you know, offered jobs you know, in the stock market. Now, at least in London. So, as I'm quoting from an in Indian magazine's current science, econophysics has emerged as a growing area, as witnessed by the demand for physics PhDs on Wall Street. Though not yet on the last street. <laughs> but notice there's been a big crash in the New York stock market. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Alright, I think I'm pretty much at the end, so let me really end. Okay, these are all the ones I didn't want. <coughs> yeah. Inclusions. Okay, so I'm at the end. I'm sure you're all. Uh, so there were three main things I wanted to convey. One was the connection between entropy and options. The number of options <coughs> in any reasonably sized system is unimaginably large. 10 to the 10 to the 20. You know, it's mind-boggling. That number of options is actually related to something that we deal with and measure, and that is the entropy. This is the relation, first found by Goldsmith. Coming to the idea of ordering. Normally one would think that order and disorder are opposed. Actually they are. They are opposed. But then we often encounter the statement that entropy, entropy promotes disorder. That's not always true. Sometimes, as we've seen, entropy promotes order. And it does so by increasing the number of options, always. Think about the sliding Okay, the last thing I said is to do with problems from everyday life, traffic, crowds, and stock market. And I think what one can <coughs> learn is that, you know, modeling helps to solve problems. And somewhat imaginative modeling. Sometimes it prevents stampedes, jams, uh, it gives some insight into, etc. Stock market, let me know. You know. So this is what it is. And it, it actually, you know, is amazing even, you know, to somebody in science, how very simple ideas, <coughs> very crude ideas, actually find a resonance in the real world. They always do. Any idea which is worth anything always finds a resonance. Maybe not immediately <coughs> at some point. Therefore, it's sort of important to think. You know, come up with your own ideas. You're all <coughs> young, have a long way to go. You know, think about on your own, think about simple things. <coughs> Those get you quite far. Okay. All right, so the last slide I have. Um, 
No, no, it's the same slide, right? I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. So this is the person who's sort of caught in a jam. And he's just left the lecture and he's dozing. Okay, so this is my institute. This is an open invitation to any one of you who want to come and visit. This is at the other end of Bombay, the south. It's called the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. There's a beautiful building, but I thought I would show you the lawn. <laughs> we thank Professor Varma for having spared the time to give us this wonderful talk. We would like to express our gratitude to him in the form of a moment.